Vertical handhelds are easily my favorite kind. They just carry so much nostalgia with that Game Boy Light 4 factor that every time a company announces one, I can't help but get excited. But is the RG Nano one you should consider picking up, or are you better off looking at some other choices? Well, let's find out. Also, in case you didn't know, it's tiny. So as usual, let's start by taking a look at the price and the specs. It comes in at $65.99 if you get it straight from Amernic. For OS, we have a Linux Duo Boot with Retro FE and GMenu 2X. Our CPU is an ARM Cortex-A7 clocked in at 1.2 GHz. For RAM, we have a whopping 64MB of LPDDR2. Storage is going to be a 64GB SD card that comes preloaded with games and a little bit of music and video. Our screen is a 1.5 inch IPS, 240 by 240, which means it's going to scale great for Game Boy and Game Gear. It has a metal shell, which means it's going to get a little bit warm if you really push it. For battery, we have a 1050 milliamp battery, which you're going to get about 2-3 to three hours of gameplay and about 45 hours of standby if you just leave it on that clock screen or just listening to music. For charging, we have a USB Type-C port, which you can also use to plug directly into your PC and do file transfer that way. It supports MP4, MP3, FLAC, OGG, and other video and music formats. So definitely not the most powerful handle we've seen, but it's still really amazing to see what we're able to get out of something this small. I would have definitely been blown away if as a kid you told me we'd be able to play up to PS1 on something this tiny. Alright, let's unbox this little guy. And overall, the packaging is pretty basic, there's not a lot going on, nothing in the back, and on the bottom we just have a couple color options. But overall, I've always been very surprised how good a lot of these boxes feel on a lot of these handhelds, even the cheaper ones. It's almost like most of the money goes into the box and not the handheld itself. Pretty amazing stuff. In the box you're going to get a user manual, which is going to be pretty useful because it's going to show you the function keys for both games and when you're listening to music. This is pretty useful because I completely ignored it and for the first few minutes using it I was just pressing stuff randomly trying to figure out how to get stuff to work and I could have just used this all along. So definitely don't just throw this out. Just throw it in the box and if you ever need it, pull it out. Just hoard it like you will every box for every handhold you ever buy because we all know you can't throw the box away. In the box, you're also going to get another smaller box, which I had some trouble opening here. I trust that you're not going to have the same issues, but I just couldn't get this little headphone attachment to come out. But that is the other thing that's included in here. You're going to get a USB-C to 3mm jack attachment. So if you do want to use this as an MP3 player, you're going to be good to go right out of the box. And it's really nice that they added this because it's just going to save you from having to go track one down. And we can all use it. Most of our phones don't even have a headphone jack anymore, so pretty useful. Also, there's this nice little keychain attachment, which is actually pretty sturdy, a lot sturdier than I would have expected. I don't know if you really want to put this little guy on your keys, but it is cool that they added that. And finally, the handheld itself. Now let's take a look at the device itself. On the bottom, we have a speaker grill. Next to that, we have a little nine yard attachment. Nothing on the left side. On the right side, we have our SD card slot. We have a power button. And over here on the top, we have our L and R buttons, a USB Type-C port, and that's about it for the top part. On the back, we just have some text and some really cool design choices like these lines back here and the fake speaker grill in the front. Just gives it more of that classic Game Boy, Game Boy Pocket type look. In the front, we have our four face buttons, our start and select, and our D-pad, and these are all gonna be membrane-based, so they're nice and quiet when you press down on them. The D-pad has a really good pivot on it, and it's nice and bouncy when you fully depress it, and also it doesn't go flat with the shell. Same thing with these face buttons. They don't go flush with the shell, which is really nice, and they're nice and springy. So overall, no real complaints about how the buttons and D-pad feel. It's more about actually using them where the problems come in. The buttons at the top are super clicky, but that's pretty normal with most of these handhelds. You're going to get really clicky shoulder buttons. Overall, the buttons feel really good. It's just their size that might be an issue for a lot of people. Getting the ergonomics right on something this small is a huge challenge unto itself. 
I mean, it's smaller than the palm of your hand, and if you compare it to something like the Miu Mini, you can see it just gets absolutely dwarfed by it. Which is funny to see because the Mini is already a very small handhold as it is. But somehow, it's really not that bad. It's obviously not going to be 351V levels of comfort when you're trying to play a game here, but if you're just going to grab this for a short little game session, it's going to be perfectly usable. The shoulder buttons are in the right spot and all the buttons have a distinct feel to them so you're not going to get accidental presses of let's say A and B when you're trying to play something like Mario on this thing. It does get a little bit warm but luckily you're not really going to be gripping this thing with your full hands so you're not going to notice that a lot. Other than just feeling a little bit warm when you're playing some PlayStation 1 games, it's really not a big deal. So yeah, overall ergonomics aren't really a big negative on this thing. Just keep in mind that it is tiny and it's not going to be great for long play sessions. Not that the battery would really lend itself for something like that, but still. So just to give you a better idea of how small this thing really is, let's do some size comparisons. So first off, we're going to take a look at the Trim UI Smart, which just looks absolutely huge next to this thing. And that's crazy because the Trim UI Smart's pretty small as it is. It's just a little bit chunky. It's really good. I just, I don't like how clicky it is. Moving on, once again, we have the Miu Mini, which I just can't get over how big the Mini looks next to this thing. It's just crazy. Moving on, we have the 280V, which just so happens to be my favorite small form factor handheld. I think it's more comfortable. And as you can see, the 280V screen is the size of the full-on Nano. Which, now that I think about it, I should probably do something with this 280V. Might make a video about this later. Moving on, we have the very popular Miu Mini Plus, which is just a bigger version of the Mini. Which, if the Mini was making this thing look small, well, you can see on screen the size difference. And the 35XX, which is probably the most popular of Amberdenic's current handhelds, and it's also arguably its biggest competition. They're both priced very similarly, and you can still get a 280V as well. So it's really weird that Amberdenic put this out of this price because they already have other handhelds competing with their own handheld. Up next, we're going to talk about the software experience. And as of the making of this video, I am running the latest update, which brings RetroArch, some improved uh, performance and some other functionality to the device. And this has got to be the easiest handheld to update so far. All you do is take that SD card out, pop it in your PC, open it up and drop the update file right into the root of the SD card. And that's it. Next time you put the SD card back in and you turn it on, it's going to do the update. It's going to take a couple minutes and then that's it. You don't have to do anything else. All right. Whenever you turn on the handheld, you're going to see this clock. And the first time you do it, you're going to want to make sure you set the time on this because there is a real time clock. So if you wanted to play some Pokemon games on here, you're going to be able to take advantage of this. But anyway, once you get to this screen, you're going to want to press start and that's going to boot you into the OS. And here we have Gmenu2x, which is one of two options for an operating system. And it's not as clean, it's a lot more clunky, but it is where you're going to find your apps and all of your standalone emulators. So it is going to give you a little bit more versatility when it comes to playing some games. There's two areas where you can launch games from and one is going to be your emulators, which is just all of the standalones and the other one's going to be your RetroArch. So depending on what system you want to play and what options you want to have, you can be bouncing back between those two tabs and picking from cores with RetroArch or standalones. You're also going to have some pre-built in games. So if you really need to get that Minecraft fixed, I guess this is one way to do it. But yeah, there's a few pre-installed games and who knows, you might find what you like. Who am I to judge? You know, some of these games are just nice little time killers. Up next, we have our media section, and here's where you can find your video and music player. Now, the video player can play both video and music, but when I was trying to use it, I wasn't able to switch tracks, so I would say don't use that and just go for the music app. And here you're going to be able to create your own playlist, and you're going to be able to use the buttons for your interface, for switching tracks, volumes, and all that. There isn't a whole lot going on here, and it's not exactly the most user-friendly music player I've ever used, but once you spend a little bit of time with it, you'll get the hang of it. Now, I don't know how many people are going to go out there and buy this as a music player, but the option is nice. Unfortunately, there's a few things that make it not great as a music player. And one of them is that as far as I could tell, you can't turn off the screen and listen to music. But let's let it play for a little bit and see how loud it gets.
The speakers do get pretty loud and I really hope that that screen issue is something that can be fixed in a future update because that would make it a lot better as a music player. Overall, it's not the best experience with it, but let's hope it can be improved so that the controls are a little bit better and those quality of life improvements do come. Because it would be really cool to actually use this as a music player, it's just, it's not there right now. So we're going to move on and to exit you're going to press start and select and that's going to bring you back to the main menu. Now over here, there's a couple other things to talk about before we show the different OS and one of them is RetroArch, which I was really excited to see that they actually brought RetroArch to the Nano. That's awesome because that also means that now we have access to one of my favorite features of all time and that's fast forward. Now to show you this, what we have to do is go over to the RetroArch tab and pick the core. We're going to be using Game Boy for this because not every core has this option unfortunately. But luckily Game Boy does, so we're going to launch a Game Boy game. And to get into those options, what you're going to do is press the power button and that's going to bring up this special menu. And here you're going to be able to adjust volume, brightness, save state, all of that. But what we want to do is go down to where it says advanced. And I apologize if the screen is so hard to see. It can be a little bit tricky sometimes to get lighting and the camera to play well together. But once you're there, what you're going to want to do is go to where it says emulator controls. And here you're going to be able to bind a key to fast forward. Also to save state and some other things. This is basically going to be your hockey menu. All I did here was bind R to fast forward. And for Game Boy games, this is perfect because you're actually not going to be using LNR. So they can just act as hotkeys. And once you do that and you get back into the games, you're going to be able to press R to fast forward. So if you're playing any RPGs like Pokemon or Dragon Quest and you want to go through some grinding pretty fast, you can be able to use that feature and breeze through those less than enjoyable parts of those games. But having access to this menu at the touch of a button is really cool because it makes controlling everything really easy. Like I mentioned before, you can do your volume, your brightness from here, but you can also adjust your aspect ratio, save state and all of that without having to go into another menu. Now unfortunately, you're not going to be able to access those advanced settings in every single emulator. It's only going to be in certain RetroArch cores. So here, if I open up a standalone Game Boy emulator, you can see that the advanced options aren't there. So I can't fast forward, I can't do any of that. Now, if you don't want to mess with all of this, you don't really care about the music player, you just want fast access to your games, all you have to do is from the main menu, press that power button and go down to where it says set retro FE launcher. This is going to set you with the author launcher, which just lets you get right into your games without having to worry about all this other stuff. And luckily it remembers your selection. So the next time you boot it up, you're going to be able to get right back into that launcher and you don't have to mess with that other stuff. You still have to go through this clock screen, which is a little bit annoying after a little while, but it's not a big deal. On this side, you're just going to be able to scroll through your systems and pick your games. It's a much cleaner interface, but like I said before, it's a lot more bare bones. If you do just use the games that are pre-installed, you're going to have box art for most of them. And if you do decide to add your own and you wanted to add your box art, all you have to do is Get a PNG file with the image that you want and name it exactly the same as the ROM that you want to link to. Drop them in the correct folders and once you do that, the system's going to do it automatically and when you scroll through your games, you can have that nice box art. Now I didn't do that because I don't really care too much with the screen this size. But if you do want to have it all nice and tidy, it's really easy to do that. Now, before we move on to some games, we do have to do the all important D-pad test. And luckily we have an onboard app to check that with. And unfortunately it doesn't pass the D-pad test. It just gets a lot of false diagonals. And if you're holding it down and you wiggle it around a little bit, it's gonna press left and right. But I'm really not sure what they could have done outside of maybe going with some dome switches for the D-pad. But if you do that, I feel like it's not really gonna be an Embernic product anymore. But to be fair, you can't really expect the most precise controllers on something this small. It's just, there's not a whole lot you can do about that. So considering that it's this size, I think we can all give it a little bit of slack and just accept its shortcomings. Now let's get into emulation. And first off, we're going to do Game Boy games. Since this is probably the system everybody's immediately going to think about as soon as they see this little guy. And these games really shine on this tiny little display because they were originally made with a small screen in mind. So while the Game Boy screen wasn't this small, you're still going to be able to read everything and everything on screen is going to be pretty easy to see. 
And because Game Boy games were pick up and play by nature, they're going to feel right at home on this tiny little system. You're also going to get the best battery life because they're not very demanding. So it's just a perfect match for the Nano. And I dare say that in recent years, Game Boy games have become pretty underrated. So this might be a perfect chance for you to dive back into some of those games when you're standing in line at the bank or you just got a couple minutes to kill. Up next, we have Game Boy Advance, and while the games do work, it's just not a good experience simply due to the aspect ratio of the screen. It's just too small, and if you stretch the games out, they just don't look right. So Game Boy Advance is going to be one of those that if you have really good eyesight, you might be able to get away with, but I just wouldn't recommend it on here. Now, if there's a turn-based game or maybe an RPG that you really want to play, then you might be able to get away with it, but just keep in mind that it is going to be hard to read just because the image is going to be so small. Up next we have NES and 4x3 content is just at the very limit of what's going to be playable on this tiny little screen. It's going to be just big enough to where you can get away with it and luckily most of the NES games are going to be playable on this system. Now you are going to have some outliers like Yoshi's Island, Star Fox, Star Fox 2 that are just going to be too hard to run for this chip but for the most part you can expect the majority of games to work. Now the ones that are going to work the best are going to be things like RPGs because of that fast forward function it's going to make it a lot easier to get through a lot of them but keep in mind the text is going to be pretty small so there are some compromises to be made. And this also applies to all the 8 and 16-bit 4x3 systems like NES, Sega Genesis, Master System. All of those are going to be playable. They're actually going to play better than the Super Nintendo. But keep in mind, the compromises are going to apply. Up next, we have PlayStation 1. And this is as far as we can push emulation on the Nano. And it's pretty amazing to see something this tiny running PlayStation 1 games. Now keep in mind, not every game is going to be playable. Some of the harder to run ones are going to chug, but still... The PS1 library is huge and I'm sure you're going to be able to find something you can boot up when you've got a couple minutes to kill. You can also play some classic arcade games and like I've mentioned before, I'm not exactly the biggest arcade guy. My exposure to arcade games was mostly things like Metal Slug, so I'm probably not the best person to ask about those systems. But I do enjoy it whenever I do pick up some of these games and play them, so it's probably time I take a deeper dive into classic arcade. But what I was really excited to see was Pico A support because when I first saw this little handheld I knew it would make a great little Pico system thanks to that one by one screen and just how easy it is to carry around. Pico A games are just meant to be pick up and play so that's awesome and I really feel like they add a lot of value to the Nano. Other systems can play this but for some reason they kind of feel at home on a tiny little handheld. So if you haven't checked them out before be sure to give them a try because they're just a good time. So the Nano has lived in my pocket for the last couple of days and I think at this point I've spent enough time with it to form an opinion about it. And I have to say, if somebody wants an everyday handheld, the main go-to, this isn't going to be it. It's just too small, it's not comfortable for long play sessions, the battery life isn't great on it, and for the price there are other options, even options from Anbernic themselves. Like I said earlier, the RG35XX is a solid choice for about the same price, it can play a lot more, and arguably it's one of the best handhelds available right now in that budget category. So if you're looking for an everyday daily driver, this definitely isn't going to be it. But that doesn't mean it's not a good handheld and sure it might be a novelty at the end of the day because it's a tiny little thing but like I said at the beginning the best handheld is the one you have on you. So if you really have about 60 bucks burning a hole in your pocket and you want a fun little handheld that's still going to be playable maybe a conversation starter something you can give to your kid that you know he's not going to be able to break then yeah this is going to be a good choice. Overall would I recommend it over what's available on the market? Probably not. Would I recommend it to anybody looking for a tiny handheld that can do a lot? Yeah, definitely. This is probably going to hold up better than a lot of the other tiny options. And it's definitely a cool little collector's item. So that's my opinion on the Nano. I think it's awesome. I think it's amazing that you can play so much on something so small. I don't think it can fill the role as a main go-to handheld and I think if you're in the market for a handheld you should probably spend your money on some of the other better options out there. But again if you want a cool little device that's going to do a lot of things then yeah go ahead and pick one up. And that's going to wrap it up. 
Don't forget to add in the comments if you're going to pick one up, if you're interested in it, or just in general what you think about the Nano. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe. It really helps the channel grow, and if you liked the video, don't forget to give it a like. I hope to see you in the next one, and have a great day.